for those unfamiliar with Mira, which <laughs> weird, she is the founder of Red and Co, the female and minority owned company working at advertising and technology that manifests ideas that mobilize culture, helping brands make a larger, more meaningful impact on society. And you may have heard Ren and Co created Made with Code, one of Google's most important initiatives to diversify tech and Netflix's lauded brand campaign, Make Room, that positioned Netflix as a champion of diversity and inclusion. Ren and Co's clients also include Diageo, Lululemon, New Belgium Brewing, Uber, Adidas, Nike, Planned Parenthood, YouTube, and Ace Hotel. Mira started at Widen and Kennedy, creating award-winning campaign, The Girl Effect, Target, Coke, and Travel Oregon. Her passions are her family, her spiritual mindful practices, and learning to cook her mama's food. She sees nature as her greatest yeah. teacher, and she's most proud to be raising three multicultural, multiracial, and multilingual daughters. So one thing that we're missing by doing this on Zoom is that the applause for our speakers. So I'm gonna ask everyone to come off of mute for just a second to give Mira that proper welcome. Mira, thank you so much for being here. Yay. Thank you. Thank you guys. Ooh. You know, it's super emotional to be here with you guys because I feel like I was just at VCU, but it was like 20 years ago. <laughs> Um, you know, I was literally one of the first graduating classes. I graduated in 2002, um, but for some reason, it doesn't seem like that long ago, but it was a while. And you know, that ECU has such a special place in my heart because it's really where I landed. You're not from America. I came here as an immigrant. I landed in Richmond, Virginia at VC Brand Center, and it became my first home. So you know, um, just talking to you guys today is really um, heartwarming. And um, I kind of goes back all full, full circle, we're going, we're going back to the beginning. So hi, I'm Mira Kadura. Uh, I'm the founder and executive creative director of Writing Co. Actually, before we start, can everybody get up? I feel like, you know, you've probably been sitting all day. You probably just ready for dinner or drink. Everybody just get up for a second. Just stretch your hands out and move a little bit and just wake up body. <laughs> just stretch and yawn. I always feel like with yawning, you just fake it a few times and then you'll really yawn for real. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I just wanted to walk you through a little bit about uh, on this journey of how I got here. So VCU is kind of where I started. I actually created this uh, work at VCU when I was there. I did this interactive conceptual art project um, that for anybody who's not familiar with this project, it's uh, basically we got a chance to, they said, pick a topic that you're passionate about and create a piece of work around it. And what I ended up doing is I, when I moved to the States, I was really, really blown away uh, you know, I come from Lebanon, um, sources of media, they try to make their own points of view. And for me, I had landed in the States and I was like, how do people believe everything that the media says to them? Like, wait a second, like it's all half of it's not real and half of it is fake and ha what? So for me, it was I wanted to create this huge mural that basically had all, all these messages that the media was feeding us. And underneath this um, big mural, I basically created, I had this little opinions box underneath it. And I asked people to give their opinion. And this was like a really big mural in the middle of the old BCU brand center. And in this opinions box, people like took sometimes like 10 minutes to fill out their opinions and then went to put their opinions in the box. And I had a shredder hidden in there that just shred their opinions apart. So basically I was just telling everybody that, you know, even though they think that their opinion is theirs, it's actually being fed to them. So this project landed me um, a, a, a position at Wyden and Kennedy. This is kind of what got me my job. So it wasn't a traditional ad portfolio. Dan Wyden is kind of notorious for this, for seeing potential in people and seeing, loving the way people think and then just giving them a job. And it happened to me, it happened to Jeff Klin, it happened to a bunch of other uh, creative people that got hired there. So that landed me at Wyden and Kennedy. I spent 10 years at Wyden. If you ever get a chance to work there, work there. 
it is unlike anywhere you'll ever work. Uh, it's a super special place and you learn there and you make friendships there unlike anywhere else. And after 10 years of being at Wyden, I kind of started, there was a bunch of different things that started happening, but I'd say one of the biggest thing that happened to me is I realized that I was there, I was working on Nike, you know, I grew up as an athlete. So for me, Nike was like the holy grail. I couldn't have been at a better place for 10 years to work on work that inspires people and gets them to be active and gets them to, you know, say messages that empowered and inspired like millions of people that I'll never ever meet. Um, and I just got to work on all these amazing campaigns like celebrating women's butts that were big um, through the, you know, being getting shaped from sport and being, you know, all these women had all these issues. Well, I'd say we still, you know, women still have issues around their bodies, but we noticed that all these women were actually working out three, four times a, uh, a week and had these amazing strong bodies, but still had all these insecurities around their bodies. So we wanted to celebrate that. We did work like this and a lot of other work, um, too much to really talk about here. And then that led to a tons, of, tons of awards at Wyden. And it was really like everything a creative person could have wanted in advertising. The one thing or the one thing that started bubbling up for me was, you know, when I got hired at Wyden, I was probably the fourth woman in a department that was, oh, who knows? I don't know how many people were in that department, but I was the fourth woman that was hired there. And I was the probably third minority hired there. Um, I, I remember there was Jayanta and Jimmy Smith, but I can't really remember many other people. And I remember when I got there, people were like, I remember one friend that said to me, you're going to be great here. If you drink like the boys, you party like the boys, you uh, swear like the boys, you're going to do great. You know, so for me, that was a sign that I had to forget that I was a woman, forget that I was not from, you know, an immigrant, not from here, that I was a min minority. And that I had to like do as everybody, as the majority did to be successful. So I did that. And it actually you know, it worked out for a long time. But then I got to a place where I was actually really um, starting to realize that there was so much great things about who, who I was in this whole advertising world, but also there was so much richness of who I was outside of advertising that I was not bringing to the table. So a lot of people knew nothing about, nobody ever asked me about speaking foreign languages, Nobody asked me about all the culture that I was, I grew up in, um, you know, my mother tongue's Arabic. Nobody ever asked me about all this richness of all these cultures that I grew up around and all these traditions and all these perspectives. And that was just never invited to the table. So I realized that I was not bringing my whole self to work. So even though I'd had all the success and I'd done so much, I still was not really like, just entirely me at work. So, you know, one of many decisions led me to leave, uh, leave Wyden. And then I really, I didn't even know I wanted to stay in advertising. It led me to do a bunch of projects that I was really passionate about. And one of them was actually putting my biological clock online to tick down for everybody to see. You know, I started at Wyden through an interactive art project. Um, and then I kind of ended my time at Wyden by birthing an uh, interactive uh, art project. So. That project slowly made me realize that artists need money to live, that you don't initially make money out of your art. So I ended up freelancing and I freelanced, and this is just a small section, for about two and a half years, I freelanced for like every agency out there. So it was like I was in a marriage or a partnership for a really long time. And then I was free and I was just like basically dating all these people and trying to figure out like, you know, obviously making money for my art, but also trying to figure out if I want to stay in this field or not. And what I realized through this process was that there's a lot of things that I would love to see as part of my life. There was a lot of parts of who I was and a lot of parts of my identity that I would love to see come into one place. I would love to see kind of life and work really mesh together. And I didn't want to separate. I didn't, I didn't feel that you could separate because, you know, when you're at home, you think about work. And when you're at work, you think about home. So 
how could you separate? How could I just like separate these two people that I was? Um, you know, obviously I'm a woman, I'm an immigrant minority, um, now mother, I wasn't at the time. And I wanted, I wanted to uh, figure out how I can integrate all these different facets of who I was. And that just led me um, to starting Red & Co. And, you know, when I was freelancing, I was just freelancing, freelancing for agencies at the beginning. And then the freelance kind of turned into freelancing for clients. And then through working with clients, I started attracting what I put out. So when I started owning who I was and being unapologetic about who I was and putting out there all these facets, to who I was, I started attracting those people and those clients and the people that wanted to work with me. So I know I gave this to Ashley as the title of this because I feel it really, really summarizes um, a key idea that I wanna get across here. So as you worship, so you become. Um, so this has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with where you place your attention who you surround yourself with, what kind of music you listen to, what kind of stuff you consume on social media, everything, right? Like everything that takes your energy is what you become. So this really has become like a foundational uh, piece to this company that I've created. And I'm just going to take you through some things that ended up shaping this agency that I ended up uh, creating. So. This is the, here you see a little little uh, screen grab of uh, what our space looks like. So we kind of, I ended up attracting a lot of people that I would say just did not fit into the mold of the typical, you know, obviously now pandemic and COVID and everything has made it that we are all, you know, everybody's working remotely and every, you know, all the rules have changed. But people, I've worked with people remotely for six years now, you know, since, this place started because I knew that that was a way that that was the only way for me to work. Like I knew that there was a lot of people that I was working with that did not function in these normal ways. They did not function, you know, in an office. Maybe they were more introverted. Maybe they were not even in the US. We work with a lot of people that are abroad in Europe and South Africa and people are in different time zones and people are in different places. So you know, why did everybody have to be in a physical location? So working remotely, um, people that didn't fit into kind of typical corporate cultures, people that felt either othered or diverse or, you know, that did not, did not, um, you know, just fit the mold. So I created this place and I started, we started working on work that we really believed in with clients that wanted to hire us to do the thing that we're passionate about. So first things first, as we worship, so you become, I just from being an immigrant, being a minority, being a woman, all this stuff, I wanted to make sure that what I create is a safe space. You know, I, you know, I just wrote this little thing here, but it's like safety supports creativity. If you don't feel safe, you're not going to bring your full self to work. You're not going to be as creative as you can be. You won't make the friendships that you can make. You won't have the trustworthy bonds that you can have. So you know, if, if you don't have that foundational safety, you just won't be able to do everything you can do out there. You know, you won't be able to really blossom into, into the best version of yourself. So that was the first thing, radically inclusive. You know, obviously this means anybody that feels others, you know, for others. So for anybody who's disabled or anybody who's an ethnic minority or anybody who's gay or Latin or older, you know, we know we, you guys, I don't know how much you know this, but you know, this is, this is not a business that you see. You certainly don't see a lot of older women in it, especially on the agency side, let alone creative women. Um, I think I know one creative woman, maybe over 50 in this entire industry, maybe two. Um, so it's just not a place that's very inclusive to all sorts of people that don't fit into the mold. So that was something that I really wanted from the very beginning. And it has actually influenced all the work that we do. We wanted this, you know, I've already touched on this. I wanted this place to be this incredibly flexible uh, and agile work environment. So, you know, you did not have to fit into that mold that everybody wants you to fit into, you know, and we're seeing it now 
we're social creatures, we want connection, but also we want a certain amount of independence to feel like we can actually have some ownership and we're not just, you know, working for the man, as they say. So we, we want to be empowered to be able to bring everything we can bring to the table. And I think this is one of the ways that we do that. Um, a plate of wellness. So you will not hear a lot of people speak about this in advertising because it's been notoriously not a very, uh, not a place of wellness at all. So this industry is really harsh. It's really hard. It's not a really easy industry. You have deadlines, you have uh, tight, tight, you know, like problems that are very complex, things that you have to solve, things that are really, really like you have to sometimes work with people that maybe you're are not like your best friends, you know, that different personalities, different really strong pair personalities that kind of come together. So how do you actually create a place that uh, make you you make sure that everybody has a certain amount of respect for each other? So even if even when you have people that are not that are not um, that don't agree or maybe that uh, have different points of view, everything can be solved with a certain amount of kindness. And you know now COVID has revealed this more than anything. But you know loneliness, grief, mental health, all these things are things that we all deal with all of us but for the longest time in this industry nobody talked about it so how do we actually talk about it and provide the tools you know when COVID started i started making everybody who wanted to meditate you know to have this relief to actually have people ha give people something that they that could ground them every day and then recently we we gave people the option to take take on this mindfulness program so how do you actually create this industry is not going to change. It's not going to get any le less, you know, it's not going to get easier. If anything, it's going to get harder. But how do we, um, as a company, as an agency, as a founder, how do I actually support everybody? So you're actually supporting people's well being and you're actually making sure that people feel supported. So then they could actually give 100 and 150%. And then obviously leading with empathy, you know. Um, it doesn't really matter how, you know, how much IQ you have if you don't have any emotional uh, intelligence, you know, people that can really connect, you know, how do you connect with people? How do you really, how do you really um, make every person feel like they're being paid attention to, you know, I think nobody's going to really remember, you know, 10, 20, who knows how many years down the line, people are really going to remember how you treated them more than anything else you know, or you're going to remember how you were treated, you know, when you have a really uh, bad experience with somebody, you don't sometimes even remember what you were even talking about, or what the whole discussion was, or argument was, but you do remember how you felt. So making sure that everybody is always, even when it's a, you know, piece of feedback that has to be given that maybe is negative, there's always a way to share that with empathy and make sure that people are set up to succeed. And then, you know, I think more than anything, we always we always try to be like a really thoughtful partner for our brands. And that's like, you know, the way we are internally is the way we are externally. And you're going to see it in a few pieces of the work that we that I'm going to show you. So here are just like these are fun little learnings that I feel are just best practices that I've learned as like life lessons, but also apply to work and everything else. So beware of energy vampires. So try to surround yourself with people that are gonna lift you up. People that are gonna give you energy, people that are gonna support you, people that are negative and wanna bring you down are just not worth your time. You know, I think it's just sad, but true, but some people just don't want to, they just always want to, you know, bring you down or put people down. And that's just not worth any of your energy as you worship, so you become, you know, who you spend your time with, what you give your attention to. If something's not working, or if you feel, you know, something's bringing you down or something, remove that thing, you know, let go. This is the fall too. Perfect, perfect season to let go. Just like all those leaves are falling off the trees, just let it go. Um, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? So this is really, I love this because you know, I ask it of how we speak to each other. I ask it of the work that we're doing. You know, um, I don't want to be doing work that adds more waste into the world and that just, you know, creates more, 
pollution, whether that's noise pollution or whether that's, you know, just creating more waste and spending. This industry has so much money in it, like brands have so much money. Why not use that money to actually say something that's going to push the world forward and move the world forward and do something that can actually like help the world move forward? Because God knows, you know, like we, we're all seeing this right now. We need all the help we can get right now to keep things moving in a positive direction. And then this last one I love because I'll just read this to you because I just love it. Um, the paradox of it's just work. We all have insecurities, imposter syndrome, paralyzing fear, creative doubt. But if this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that all the fear we have about doing good work or being good at our jobs or building a business or knowing what comes next is illusory. We don't know what's going to happen. You don't either. So why not go for it? Why not challenge yourself? Why not work as hard as you can and see what you can do to make the world better? Even though you're clearly an imposter, right? Right. Um, so here, just a little kind of summary here before we kind of just see some fun, uh, fun stuff. You know, so here we just say, you know, some of us are into yoga, some of us are into nail art, some of us are into Land Rover, some of us find life joyful, some of us manage lifelong depression. For all of us, this work, you guys are going to be spending, you know, 30, 40, 50 years of your life working, you know, this work means something and helps us feel better in the world. You cannot separate work from life. So the best thing you could do is build the best work life you can while making the work that you believe in. So it's super important to pay attention and make sure that whatever it is that you're doing on a daily basis is actually contributing to who you want to become in this world. You know, that's why it goes back to my, as you worship, so you become, you know, who do you want to become? What kind of person, what do you aspire to? And then let work feed into that, not the other way around, you know, which I think for the longest time, especially when I started out in this industry, I almost didn't think about who I wanted to become. And I just wanted to do great work at the expense of everything else. And what you realize is that's just not enough. It's just not enough to do work at the expense of everything else. There's so much, you know, like a home cooked meal, learning how to cook, you know, learning how to make something that's gonna nourish your body is just as important as doing a great job at work. Those two things are equally important. So, you know, just thinking about those things. So let's just jump, if anybody has any questions or anything, please feel free to let me know. Or also just jump in and so, show some work and then um, we could talk about stuff. Oh, so here, this is just a quick slide, just shows, you know, we have a really, really small team, but we hire a ton of freelancers and we hire a ton of um, partners, production partners. Um, and despite being such a small team, I always say we might be kind of the sm one of the smallest, but, sm but most potent agencies out there. Um, we just have so much diversity and we published our 2019 diversity numbers because we wanted to put that out there and, uh, you know, make sure that we're keeping things honest and transparent. So does anybody have any questions? Feel free to just get on mute and ask them or else I'll just keep on moving. No? Good? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk you through a few just quick case studies so you can kind of just see the work that you could be doing in the world, the work that you know hopefully will inspire you and get you excited about getting into this industry, you know, this industry has changed so much, you know, since I was at uh, Brand Center, obviously we didn't have social, I wish we did, we didn't have social, um, I wish there was all these different ways to kind of get work out there, but there's just a whole new landscape right now of how, you know, how you can connect, now you can make a difference, even outside of, outside of the traditional agency company structure like you guys as vcu brand center can come together and create something super powerful and put it out in the world and get it seen by millions of people you know that just wasn't the case when i was when i was at vcu ad center so i'll talk you through a few of these case studies i'll set up the problem that we were trying to solve and then i'll kind of show you how we solved it so google this was actually google was what was our first official kind of big client and they came to us and they said, less than 1% of girls are majoring in computer science. 
which means that girls have no say on all the technology that we're using on a daily basis, which is insane to me, you know? We have no voice. Um, we could be creating so many amazing products and so many amazing things that nobody's seeing right now because we're just not part of the conversation. So how do we change that? How do we inspire 1 million girls to code? So we went away and we said, this can't be a TV commercial. This can't be a video. This is not going to be just like an outdoor campaign. This is going to be a whole program. If we really want to change things from the, like fr the foundationally change things, we need to actually build the infrastructure. How do we do that? We said, we're going to create a program. Um, this program, we're going to come up with this big idea that is the problem is girls don't see coding as for them. They don't see it as something that they see it as boring for boys and basements, zeros and ones on a screen, everything that basically they see in the movies, you know, boys eating chicken wings in their basements um, with these screens in front of them. Um, so we're like, well, let's stop talking about code as an end in itself and start talking about it as a means to something bigger, as a means to something that girls are already passionate about. So let's connect code to fashion. Let's connect code to music. Let's connect code to, you know, diagnosing breast cancer early. Let's connect code to uh, animation. And then suddenly these girls started caring. So we created an entire brand. We called it Made With Code. We wrote the tagline. So, you know, the just do it. Things you love are made with code. And then we created the whole brand identity for it. You know, brand guidelines, all that. And then we said this whole program is going to have three different phases. The first phase is going to be inspire. You're going to get in, people inspired. So who's going to be inspired here? Two people. There's one is the girls. The girls need to be inspired. At the time when we were doing this, we were Google searching women in tech. And I swear, almost no one came up. Like nobody came up. So what we started doing is cold calling colleges, universities, high schools, MIT, like all these institutions and seeing where are the women that are doing amazing things with code that we could do documentaries about. So we started finding people like Erica Kochi at UNICEF, who's director of innovation. And we found Danielle Feinberg, who's um, the uh, director of lighting at Pixar Animation Studios. And suddenly we found all these amazing women doing all these amazing things in all these different fields. And we said, we're gonna do documentaries about them. And then second, if you're a parent or you're an educator and you don't know the power of code, how do you turn your daughter onto it? So we thought it was really important to do a film to actually inspire um, uh, parents and educators to see the value of code so they could actually, you know, offer it up to their to their uh, to, to the kids that they they're raising or they're teaching um, and then second we're like okay and I'll show you that work in a second second okay the parents and educators are inspired and the girls are super inspired and then what we needed to get them coding right away so when we first started this project you could only code on a desktop computer and we all know girls are not on their desktop computers where are they they're on their phones so we needed to create a mobile first experience where we got girls coding right away and we got them to actually code these amazing so we decided we're gonna we're gonna create these amazing coding projects also in all these different fields so you're gonna be able to code a musical bb or you're gonna be able to animate like this little monster on stage or you're gonna be able to uh, uh code a 3d printed object and get it printed and shipped to your home but we're gonna make it really easy. We're gonna lower the barrier of entry. So it's gonna be mobile first. And then we're also gonna create it. We're gonna create these coding projects with a block-based coding language. So you can like learn the logic of coding through these and learn really, really actually complex coding principles, but through this really kind of uh, simple way. Um, and then third, we said that we're going to build these coding projects based on a curriculum. So we're not just going to do, oh, hey, some fun cookie coding projects, but we're actually going to teach them something. So each coding project built on the next one and actually taught girls more and more. So I'll show you some of this work. And then there's a third phase that I'll talk about a little later. I'll show you some of this work. The world is made with tiny bits, with invisible stuff and weightless things. The world is made with DNA drawn together into tigers and cathedrals and snow cones. 
The world is made with bits of language, letters and spaces and numbers, organizing nations and brunch and love. The world is made with you, unreplicable, particular you, who are made with tiny bits and words strung together, you whose effect can be enormous, life-changing, history-making, world-better-making. The code to change is also made with tiny bits and bites drawn together, to dig wells, to share a joke with millions, to get directions. You are a girl who understands bits exist to be assembled. And when you learn to code, you can assemble anything that you see missing. And in so doing, you will fix something. Or change something. Or invent something. Or run something. And maybe that's how you will play your bit in this world. And then I'm going to show you this one documentary. Obviously, um, you can see the rest of these on our website, but I'm just going to play one just so you kind of, um, I had a secret little agenda with all these documentaries that not only are we going to connect code to a passion of these girls, but we're also going to uh, give little words of wisdom that I wish I had learned, you know, 20 years ago. Whoops. My name is Danielle Feinberg. I am a director of photography for lighting at Pixar Animation Studios. Growing up, I was fairly shy. And so as I was going through school at Harvard and then at Pixar, and there's all these smart people, and you sit in the room and people say things, I would think, I don't, I don't know if I would have known that. But he said it so strongly, it must be right, you know? And so it took me a long time to actually realize that these guys didn't actually know any more than I did. They just believed in what they thought. To me, light is everything, because if we don't put any lights into our films, like, all you would get is black. And depending on the way you put your lights in there, it can look crummy and silly, or very computery, or very false. Or it can look like magic and, and create a world and bring it to life. And, and that's the thing for me in lighting that's, like, my favorite thing. And there's a point where you look at it and it goes, it's real, like it's a real place that you can visit, sort of. And I, that's just like pure magic. There's a million things you can do with code in animated films. You could use code to make a leaf flutter. You can make a, a giant head of red curly hair that moves appropriate with the character. You can uh, make water. You can make schools of fish with code. You can uh, have a car drive on a road with code. You can make cloth that moves with the characters. There's so many things you can do with it. It just goes on and on and on. I wish for the younger generation of girls to just believe in themselves and put their voice out there so they can be heard and be a part of the conversation. Um, okay, so we did those documentaries, we did that film, and then here are the projects that we did, so the coding projects. Um, and we did about 13 of these. The one that we launched with, because we wanted to kind of do a really huge launch for this, was the 3D printed object. So we thought, you know, what a better way to launch this thing than to show girls that coding can actually, code can be actually tangible and it can create a real product and it can be really creative. Um, so basically what we did is we got them to be able to code this um, bracelet uh, that you could go on the website and you could basically code this uh, bracelet through the coding, la uh, coding uh, language called Blockly, and then you could render this uh, bracelet, you could put in the color, you could put in the message, you can put in the diameter, and then magically, magically with a whole ton of backend work, um, this package showed up at home and congratulating, congratulated you on becoming a coder for the first time, which was really quite amazing. I think, um, I think that somebody posted this project on Reddit and a whole bunch of boys started ordering this bracelet because they thought it was so cool. But this project was obviously for the girls, for teen girls. And we're like, stop ordering bracelets. This is like 
<laughs> not the point. <laughs> so we had a ton of orders from boys too. So, you know, here's the thing too. You make something that is not, there's nothing about this that is for girls, right? That was our target. But you make something cool that's inspiring and everybody wants to do it, you know? And I think that's like a huge lesson here. Even though it was targeted towards girls, it was so inspiring and connected with so many people that boys wanted to do it too. And like, what about us, you know? So um, here you could just see a bunch of these bracelets. And then we did this big event with a bunch of different people. Uh, and then Made With Code started being used both at high schools uh, as a platform to get girls into get girls into coding. And then the documentaries were used in colleges to recruit girls into computer science. And then uh, sometimes in advertising, you do something, it lives for five seconds and it disappears. Uh, this whole thing became an actual program at Google. In the programs for six months, our goal was 1 million girls coding on Made With Code. And in the first six months, we had 5 million girls coding on this website, which was kind of epic and like nothing we would ever expect. So just kind of goes to show you that you can apply all these things that you're learning, strategy and creative and creative technology and all these things all into one thing that doesn't just have to be like a one piece of communication. You know, you can do so much like that's what's so cool, actually, about this field that you guys are in is that there's so much you could do with it. And there's so many things that you guys can like partner up even within the school, right? Even within your, your different groups of people. And you could create a lot of really amazing things. You guys could create a product, a software. You could create so many things. You could you know, uh, create the positioning for it. You could create the branding for it, all that. Um, so here, I know we're starting to run out of time. I'm gonna go through these, through these really quickly. So film is an actual Red & Co IP project. Um, so it, it's owned by Red & Co. We own the IP for this whole thing. It's an idea that we came up with and we're like, we're gonna create a brand and we're gonna basically put it out into the world. So um, we all know we spend uh, an hour maybe on Netflix or on Hulu or on Amazon Prime trying to find something to watch and we can never find anything. And then we get tired and we go to bed <laughs> and that's our night. <laughs> So we're like, wait, that's a problem and we're gonna fix it. So we created a place called Film, um, which basically helps you find movies through the way you're feeling, um, which you know we don't search by drama or sci-fi. That's not a human way to search. So you could go to film.com. It's a cross-platform, uh, a whole cross-platform experience. You can go to film.com. You can download it as an app. Um, you could have it, you can get it on uh, your Apple TV. But it basically is uh, a whole platform where you get to search by feeling. So here's a little demo, just so you see. You're able to scroll through, I feel like eating people. I feel like flirting with fear. I feel like sweet 16 love. I feel like learning a hard truth, et cetera, et cetera. And you get to like choose what it is that you feel like feeling. And then you get all these amazing suggestions. And these are all not done by an algorithm, but done by movie lovers and people who love movies. So you'll see foreign films, you'll see indie films, you'll see blockbusters, you'll see a whole range of film. And it's become like a film discovery platform where you can actually find films that maybe you would never know of just because they make you feel a certain way. So be, be sure to check it out. Um, so Fat Tire, Fat Tire, this is actually a recent project that we worked on. Uh, it launched, I think, in August. So Fat Tire came to us and said, hey, you guys, we're going to be the first national brewery to be carbon neutral. And this is kind of a big deal. No, we, there is no brewery in the entire country that's carbon neutral. How do we actually make an announcement and get a ton of press around this thing that's a big deal? And we said, well, you know, carbon neutrality is not really something that people are going to be like, yay, carbon neutrality. It's just not something that people get so excited about because I think more than anything, they don't know how to wrap their brains around it and what it all means. And I think the climate is such a big thing to un unpack for people. But we're like, you know, this is actually really simple. How about we actually do two things? One, we create an activation to actually get people to realize what carbon neutrality means to them on a personal level. So that's the first part. So we said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to create a retail activation where we hike the price of a six pack to $100. So you're going to go into a retailer and you're going to go buy, um, you're going to go to buy your um, six pack and it's going to ring up. Actually, I'm going to show you this. 
um, it's going to ring up as $100. And you're going to be like, what? Fuck, what? And then it's going to basically tell you the story about if we keep on doing everything the way we're doing it, we're going to actually kill the earth and we're going to actually make everything that we love super, super expensive. So you take this thing that is kind of nebulous and doesn't really connect with people and you make it personal. If somebody suddenly tells you that that cup of coffee you love having every day instead of four bucks, you're going to pay a hundred bucks for it. Oh, I think you'll pay attention. So that's, you know, we did these um, newspaper ads in the New York Times. And then we said, we're going to actually create a whole platform for Fat Tire called drinksustainably.com where they're going to be able to put their best practices um, forward. They're going to become an open source platform where they could share with the entire beer industry all the things that they're doing and share it with them and they could use it and to help them become carbon neutral. And then we're also on this website, we're going to encourage um, consumers to see how they could also lower their uh, carbon footprint and do something to help. So this uh, just kind of walks you, shows you a little bit the website um, that goes with this whole thing. So you'll just see kind of, it connects the retail activation we did um, you know, why does carbon neutrality matter? The whole thing, it breaks it down for you. It tells you how it impacts all the different systems. And then it tells you what you as a consumer can do, um, which I think is pretty, uh, you know, why would beer cost so much? It explains how we got to this hundred dollar and how it's all based on science. And then it tells you all the different things that you guys can do to actually, uh, here, I'll just scroll a little bit down. See, these are the things you could do. You could vote, you know, like really vote, vote with your dollars, put your money where your mouth is, donate, uh, you know, change your electricity bill to renewable, et cetera. So um, this did a huge, huge thing for them as a um, brand. And, you know, they, they didn't spend that much money on it. And within the first week, they had 62.4 million impressions and 32 press articles, which is quite incredible for um, a small national brand. And then I'll just end on Netflix. So I don't know how many of you have seen this work, but I'll just give you a little bit of context. Netflix came to us to help them with their global brand strategy. So, you know, they're known for a ton of content and they got to a point where they couldn't just stand for content, right? Because Hulu, Amazon, everybody could beat them at that game. They can out content each other. They really needed to stand for something and they really needed to find their North Star. So they came to us, we worked on their global brand strategy and their positioning. And through that process, we came up with their brand pillars and you know all that, all that work. And then what we do oftentimes when we're working with clients and say, hey, here's some opportunities. Look at this opportunity. Look at this opportunity. There's all these different opportunities for you guys as a brand. And this was actually one of them. We said, hey, you guys have completely disrupted Hollywood. You've completely disrupted this very white, older male industry. You've changed the way we make films. You have so much diversity and inclusion. You have so much diversity in terms of who's in front of the screen, who's behind the screen. You don't like do like Disney where you ship America to the world. You actually go to Spain and you hire Spanish directors and Spanish writers and you do shows like Casa del Papel and it's like local stories. And you've completely changed this whole thing and disrupted this whole thing. So you guys need to stand for that. And you guys need to put your foot down and claim it before, you know, Apple or Amazon or Hulu or anybody else claims it. So this is the work that came out of it. Have you ever been in a room and didn't see anyone else like you? Have you ever thought you definitely belonged, but were told subtly or not so subtly that you didn't? You know these rooms. The world is full of those rooms and their limits. Limits for who gets to tell stories, who gets to write, who gets to direct, who gets to act, and who gets to see their life reflected. Let's make room for voices yet to be heard, for stories yet to be told. We're making room for you to find them and for them to find you.
Um, and then also they did not put any media money behind this. And in the first week they had a ton of press and it ended up being their most successful brand campaign from an earned media perspective. They just put it on their social, which was quite incredible. I can only imagine, so this they put it on their social during Oscars week. And I can only imagine if they had spent the money at the Oscars and put this on the Oscars, how much it would have just kind of blown, it would have blown up. So all this to show you, um, so yeah, so I'll just leave this last slide. Let me stop sharing for a second. Um, so all this to show you that, you know, right now we're at this point where people, you know, I actually really love that this is happening in, in culture right now that people are speaking up on racial inequity and how important um, all this is. I hope that this work shows you that, you know, we, we've been doing the work since the beginning and it shows how rich the work can be if you're diverse and how it's not just a, let's be diverse so we can fill a, a quota, but let's be diverse because that's what makes everything better. That's what makes the world better. That's what makes the work better. Um, and that's also how we're gonna, how we're gonna move the world forward. So for me, I would just like end this by saying, I would really encourage each and, each and every one of you to think about what are your values? Like write down your values. What are things that you value in life? What are things that you really care about that you value? And then see where that leads you in terms of work. And that's something that I didn't think about, you know, 20 years ago. And it just was not part of my, you know, just my world. I wasn't really thinking about kind of the bigger picture. Think about the kind of life you want. Think about the kind of things you want to stand for or not stand for. And how does that inform where you end up working, who you end up working with, what kind of work you end up doing? Because that's what's going to really make you happy, you know? If you get to a point where you're not really being able to create something that aligns with your values, you're not gonna be very happy. You're gonna be quite miserable actually on the contrary. So I would just really encourage you to do an exercise and write down your values. What are those things that are unshakable that you really, really, really believe in and then work from that place and try to find um, you know, jobs or opportunities or people in your life surround yourself with those people that are going to align with those values um and that's really it and i would love to hear from you guys and i would love to hear about you know what you're thinking of and if there's anything that i could like speak to or help you with um you know i'm just excited to be here to support however i can it's really great to hear you talk it's so interesting how like your ethos comes through on the most simple project or the most dynamic project. So um, I like that you're staying true to form to who you really are and your values. So thank you for sharing tonight. Thank you. Um, hi, Mara. Hi. Hi. I just wanted to say like, I love, love, love your presentation and the brand's um, standards that you shared with us about Red and Co. And I also admire that you took a leap of faith and left one of the like most desired agencies by like creatives that there is to just go and follow your heart and do what you thought was right and what you thought you needed to do. How do you get the courage to do that? You take it one day at a time you do not think, this is how I approach everything. You know, sometimes we get these projects that are so overwhelming and so big. And I feel like my whole nervous system is gonna shut down. And what you do is you just break it down, break it down into small chunks, you know, break it down into one day at a time. What, do, what can I do today? What, I, what can I do this hour? What can I do after we get off this call? You know, to just, take one step in that direction. And that's all you need to do because you take enough steps and you'll get there. Like it's gonna lead you there. That's how you do amazing things. Like when we took on that Google project, we had three people and we had sold this crazy idea that needed 50 people to make. And I was like, I think my nervous system is gonna explode. How, we were creating software for Google, you know, like insane, right? So 
how do you not let that you know overwhelm you you just take one step at a time you put your you put your intention in the right place and you put one foot in front of the other and you take small little baby steps to get there and you will get there i promise you um Thank what you. you what you said about um not fitting into the corporate world really resonated with me because um, I had an internship with Edelman. I had an internship with Ketchum and mostly with um, Edelman. I kept finding myself running up against these invisible walls of like what the corporate culture was with the, like the things that I didn't know and the people didn't feel the need to teach me. And it was such a suffocating experience that I thought maybe I'm just not built for agencies and I'm not built for like being in a corporate setting. And so just hearing that I'm not the only one who's has experienced that and then seeing that you create your own company has been very inspiring. Awesome. Yeah. You know, you just, we have a poster. We do these, every time we finish a project, we kind of do these posters of lessons that we learn. And one of our po posters says, you can't find the perfect job. You have to invent it. So that for me is such a like embodiment of, you just have to take charge of your life and of your fate and all of that and do, maybe that is for you starting a company. Maybe that's for you coming together with a group of people. Maybe that's finding a company that aligns with your values. You know, it's different things for different people. I wanted the challenge of starting a company, so I tried it. And I always used to say, people would say to me, Oh my God, isn't it scary? What if you fail? What if you, whatever? And I'm like, if I fail, that's amazing because I've learned all these lessons that I could take on to do more amazing things. It's amazing if you fail, we should celebrate failures. And, and I'm, I always used to say, what's the worst that can happen? I'll just go get a full-time job. <laughs> like that's the worst that can happen. If like this whole thing goes away, I'll just get a full-time job or I'll start a new thing, you know, but you just build, you're constantly building on all the life experiences that you have and all the work experiences that you have. And that's how you create a life. And that's how you create like what you want to be doing in the world, you know, and that's how you figure it out. Like we, none of us know what we're doing. I think I mentioned it in our, in my presentation, like nobody knows, even the people that say that they know, they don't know, nobody knows, especially now. <laughs> like, did we know we were going to be in the middle of this pandemic, you know, at home, <laughs> not leaving our homes? Like nobody knows anything. And the people who say they know, they don't know. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I just want to say thank you for coming to talk to us. This was super inspiring and super empowering for me because I am half Egyptian. So I never see anyone like me. Awesome. So it was very nice to hear about the highs and the lows and the success. And like, I remember saving some of the ads you created. And I probably still have them. But I always like have enjoyed advertising and would save it. I thought the butt one was very creative. Like, <laughs> good butt. So, thank you. Thank you. I think it's also been um, <laughs> crazy to see what advertising can really do because I actually started off in PR because I love the ability for us to be able to connect to one another and be able to spark those things that all make us human like happiness, joy, sadness and like connect us through media. But um, now that I'm coming back into like marketing, it was difficult for me to, to see like how can I, like how selling a product really like bettering the world. So you've definitely helped me like open my eyes to there's possibilities beyond like selling a brand, like selling a product like Coca-Cola or a shoe and actually like sell a difference to the world. Mm -hmm. So thank you. You're welcome. Mira, I wanted to ask about finding those agencies that align with our values because, you know, there's Red & Co. And then outside of a few other independent agencies, there's those three huge holding companies. So do you have any advice for us who are trying to find, I know you said the perfect job doesn't exist, but finding those teams. I would find people you admire. I would find people you admire and go towards those people. So I don't think you work, you don't work at companies because of the companies, you work at the companies because of the people follow the people that inspire you that are going to that you're going to learn from that you could like that could take you in and nurture you and set you up to succeed that's what you need so it could be 
I don't know, it could be a holding company, crazy, huge, 6,000, but you feel like this one creative director or with this one head strategist or this one person will like take you in, teach you some things, nurture you and really help you kind of flourish and bloom in this industry. That's what you want. So it doesn't almost matter what the actual like company is. It's whether or not those people are going to give you the time and effort and, you know, into like becoming who you want to become and learn all the things you want to learn. So I would just find those people and you can find them, you know, there's enough people out there. You could research them. You could, people love to like, you know, I used to, I swear when I left VCU, I had this journal. I should find this journal. I had every single person that I admired in this industry. And it wasn't even just attached to the US. It was like in Amsterdam, in London, and all these places all over the place. I just had a journal where I put people's, you know, names, contacts, where they were, if I could find like a, you know, if I didn't find their personal information, I put like just a line for the company. And I would just call you know, hey, I'm in London. I'd love to take you out for coffee. Do you have half an hour to chat with me? Like just an informational chat, you know? And you never know where those lead. And I feel like now, even though none of those led to jobs for me, all those people are now peers and people that I regularly connect with and that have become part of my life because you kind of create these circles of people that you surround yourself with, you know? So write those people down. Who are those people? You see a talk that inspires you. You, uh, I don't know, uh, you're listening to Ad Color, you know, which is free this year. You guys should all, I did a panel at Ad Color this year. Everybody should sign up and go watch all the panels that they did. They were phenomenal. Um, you know, Ad Color, a 3% conference. I think 3% conference was paid if I remember correctly, but Ad Color is free. You know, there's a whole chunk of programming that was free. Um, it's all worth just watching and finding it, finding those people that you admire and follow them, follow them, try to reach out to them, try to see if you can learn more about them, try to see if they can give you half an hour of their time. You know, I think a lot of people, you know, it's always been such a huge thing for me to mentor people, but I think now more than ever, people are realizing how it's also their responsibility to do that. So I, you know, I, I would just try, I would just try, what do you, what do you have to lose? Nothing really, you know? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anyone else have any thoughts or any? I still have, I'm okay. Ashley booked my time out for another 19 minutes. So I'm good if you guys have any more things you have questions about. Um, so hello, my Hi. name is Parisa. Um, so you had mentioned that, you know, something you love to do is like mentor and something I personally am always trying to like, my biggest hurdle is that is imposter syndrome, right? And I, I try to constantly remember, like, there's a reason why I'm here and like, you know, why I've gotten so far based on the work that I previously done. But what do you try to tell people in sort of a mentee situation of what else they can do other than just like, you know, believing in yourself? Because something that you like, obviously, is one of the things that, you know, can overcome imposter syndrome, but it's, I think it's one of the hardest things to do because it's getting over that mental barrier. So I was wondering if you had any other advice, or maybe there's like a routine that you've set, you know, to like reinforce these ideas that like, you're here and it's what you're doing is worth it, so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, um, it's so interesting when you start out in this industry, and you guys will probably notice it when you start out um, and you have, for example, a presentation where you have to take a bunch of people through a presentation, right? And a lot of times when you're starting out, everybody's been in this industry longer than you have, and you're intimidated and you feel like you're going to fuck up or you're not going to do a good job or whatever. And I feel like over time, I would say to myself, just fuck it, just say it, just say it. Like, just, just, just uh, you know, like I would force myself to put my voice out there because I'm like, I don't know if all, and that's, you know, you notice probably in Daniel Feinberg's uh, documentary, which we did in every other documentary as well, these little bits of like nuggets of things. Like she said, you know, put your voice out there. It's like, you only mm -hmm. lose if you hold back, you know, you can only learn by putting your voice, even if it ends up being like not 
the perfect thing to say, or maybe didn't add as much as like you wanted to, but you have to, you have to practice. And this is true for everything practice. You have to practice making your voice louder. You have to practice putting your ideas out there. You have to practice feeling like you have a seat at the table, because if you don't feel you have a seat at the table, Mm -hmm. I will promise you, nobody else will think you have a seat at the table. You know what I mean? Like you have to believe that you deserve to be there and that you deserve to be heard and that you're going to say what you're going to say at the beginning. Maybe it won't be this amazing thing, but Mm -hmm. little by little, as you get better at your job, you will get more confident and you will actually start saying things that really contribute and are really respected and admired by your peers. Mm -hmm. So it's just practicing and you know, different people do things differently. Some people are super extroverted and some people are introverted and some people don't, you know, one of my big things when I started this place is like, some people literally like one of my programmers can't see people. He just can't see people from day one. He just can't, he he is just, he has anxiety, he has Mm -hmm. mental, Um, health issues. He just cannot be around people. He's completely, he'll shut down, but he's a genius. Do I force him into an office? No. Do I force him to get on Zoom calls? No. Can he follow direction and have a project manager, you know, get what we need when we need it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I would say just in general, get like, it doesn't even have to be in a big way, little things like it could be Mm -hmm. Think of your personal relationships. Maybe there's something that you feel you haven't brought up to your sister or to a friend or whatever. Get the courage to kind of have them in small chunks, right? Have these conversations that make you feel more confident and make you feel like you can actually share them in small Mm -hmm. capacities. And then that will grow just like anything. You nurture anything and it grows, you know? So Mm -hmm. it's practice. It's like, what do you want more of in your life? practice doing that and that's you will get better you just will i promise you thank you i will i will do that i will keep practicing Mm. anything else i have a really quick question i don't know if you can answer this because yeah. Looking back, giving advice, it's like, oh, I totally should have done that. I'm not going to say hindsight is 2020 because we're here now and it's a hot garbage mess. If you could give yourself advice on how you manage your brand center experience, what would it be and why? If I could give myself advice on how I manage my brand center experience, what would it be and why? Um, you know, when I went to Brand Center, you know, you're, I didn't get a scholarship. I was, you know, a foreign student. You don't get any scholarships. I had to find the money to, you know, I was paying a lot of money. It's not cheap, right? So for me, I just felt that I'm going to make the most out of this and I'm going to learn as much as I can. So even though I was in the creative track, you know, the art direction track, I sat in on strategy classes. I, you know, I just, I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to be like a sponge and learn as much as possible. And I would go to teachers, you know, whether they asked for it or not, and just like pick their brains and chat with them about things. And I just wanted to learn. Like for me, it was like, I'm paying this money. I really want, the teachers are there. This is, this is, this is something that you, you know, I'm not really sure where you guys are at in your journey at uh, VCU, but This is something that I'm sure Ashley and Van and everybody would agree with. The professors, Ashley, Van, everybody are there to see you guys succeed, to set you up to succeed. They're there because they're there to support you. There is never gonna be a time where you're more taken care of and supported than at At Center or just in any like, you know, school setting, you know, where you're actually like held and nurtured and there's people looking out for you and want you to like grow and learn. I would use that time to learn as much as possible, pick their brains as much as possible. Don't be afraid to fail because honestly, they will help you. They will help you kind of bounce back. They will help you learn through your failures. 
because the world on the outside is not as kind, I would say, you know, so when you fail and you're, you know, I don't know, this has happened like throughout my career where people do things and it actually costs the company a lot of money. Those are big failures, right? Like if it costs the company money or you do something that I remember this happened once, um, I don't know, who knows how long ago, but like, you know, something that wasn't supposed to go on air was on air that the client never approved. There was a whole legal thing, you know? So it's like those, those, failures are big, right? And they're, they become lawsuits, they become financial, like huge checks the agency has to write to the client, you know? So I would use this time to just try some things, try it, you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to lose, and you have absolutely everything to gain. Try some things, you know, yes, you have some assignments, you feel like doing something else, do something else. You have this product or the service or this brand that you are, admire, do some work, team up with a few of your friends, do some work for them, present it to Van, present it to your teachers, you know, see what they think. Um, bring, like, I think this is one thing that I really, really served me well at, at Center. I think teachers kind of fed off my passion. So when I would go to them really passionate about something, they would give me more, you know, they were like giving me more. So the more passionate I was, the more passionate they were. And it became this really amazing relationship where the more you're into it, the more they're into it, right? Like if you're kind of like, I don't care, see you later, they're not gonna really be so into it. So I would encourage you to like find those things that get you up in the morning. What do you wanna change? What do you wanna fix? What do you wanna do? What do you... And, and work on those. Yes, you might have assignments, do those too, yes. But you know, you're gonna have some assignments that you maybe don't love, you know, in the real world, but find those things that you're also really passionate about and bring those to your teachers and ask them their opinion and see how you can get better and see how your copy could get better or your strategy can get better or your art direction can get better because they want to help you. That's what they're there for. They're not doing this so they can make billions of dollars and you know, retire at 50. They're doing this because they really love academics and they really love teaching and they love nurturing students. So, you know, use them and, and, and um, surround yourself with those people because you're, ne you're never going to have that. It's like the most safe environment at school or, you know, hopefully most, most of the time. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. I will carry that through. I'm in my second year in the experience design track. So awesome. we'll just have to pivot and keep pushing forward. Awesome. Um, Anyone else? Any thoughts? You could literally ask me anything. It doesn't even have to be about advertising. I don't know. <laughs> so something that I kind of wanted to ask you about was something I really loved about the things you love made with uh, made with code campaign is that you took something that was really technical like coding and you found like a really strong emotional cord. And I was wondering, like when you're thinking through ad problems, what are like questions you ask yourself to find those emotional connections or to identify opportunities to make a difference? Yeah, I always want to base it in a truth. I all, always want to base it in a truth because that's what connects us, right? Like we're all human and we all will always connect to a truth. So I think about, is it going to connect to me? Is it connect to a large, you know, is it something that's a, a, a human truth that will connect to a lot of people, right? Um, and that has never failed me, you know, and that's why I think, you know, doing advertising that just has like gags and jokes is fun, but it doesn't really build anything, you know, it doesn't really create like this really, you see it, you laugh, you move on, you know, but if you really want to do work that like, you know, lasts beyond the media cycle or lasts beyond the time that you put it out in the world, like I have some Nike work that I've done today, I was on a, on a, on a Zoom call where literally work that I did um, on girl effect, which was done over 10 years ago, people are still, you know, talking about and talking about and talking about how, you know, so many, so many people have copied that work. And so many people are still talking about that. It's 10 years, 10 years is a long time. People are still talking about that work. So, you know, same goes for like the, a lot of Nike ads that I got to work on. So I think when you base work in a truth, a human truth, and so many people can see themselves in it and so many people can connect to it, then you're, you're set, right? Hmm. 
We had a question in the chat. Someone asked, can you share with us some of your core values? My core values? Oh, whew. how much time do you have? I have a lot of core values. Um, so, and you saw some of them in the, you know, some of them in this deck that I shared. So for me, I really pay attention to taking care of my body. I feel like if I, if my body is not taken care of, if I don't feed it well, if I don't treat it well, if I don't move it, if I don't do, then I can't take care of anybody else. So I'm a mom, I have kids, I have parents that I need to get, like I have a whole ecosystem of people that depend on me, I have a company, you know, all these things. If I don't take care of this body, then this body can't be any good to anybody else. So that's like a huge thing that I value. And I make sure that I also try to support everybody else in my life to take care of their bodies. I really want to inspire everybody else to do that. So that's huge. And when there's things that come up that kind of fight that or that make me, you know, whether that's any kind of, uh, you know, it could be like suddenly there's like maybe an abusive client or something or something that becomes like just on a daily basis I know that we have to create some shifts. Like we have to change things. Either we have to have these really serious conversations. We have to stop some things. We have to change course. We have to, you know, I just, that is such an important thing. So that's something that I value very much. Um, I value relationships and um, I try to do my best to nurture those. And I try to prioritize the people that I care about the most in my life and not forget about them as work gets crazier or things come up, you know, there's so much life stuff right now coming up. So um, relationships and, you know, re relationships either die or they get stronger and it depends how much attention and time you spend nurturing them. And if that's something you care about, then you need to spend time nurturing them. Um, so that's something I value very much. Um, I value, uh, just transparency and honesty. I'm not really good with people that just, I cannot see through and I can't really, you know, that I feel have another, like some kind of agenda or, um, just aren't telling me the truth. You know, I'm just, I just don't work that way. Um, I try to imagine, and this is probably a good exercise for you guys. I try to imagine what kind of life I would want 10 and 20 years from now. Like, what, how do I see my life? You know, how, how do I, who do I see in my life? What kind of people, what kind of things, what do I want to be doing? And I try to, to do everything to kind of get there. So I'll give you one example. I mentioned like taking care of my body. So when I'm, you know, even when I don't want to do it, when I'm too tired, when I'm too exhausted, when the kids have woken me up three times at night and I have to get up and I have to work all day, you know, I'm on my yoga mat and I'm doing my yoga practice and I'm exhausted. I'm like, I could fall asleep right now. I just, I, I do not have the energy. Why am I doing this? This is, you know, at the end, obviously I feel great and I love that I did it. But what I was thinking about the other day is I'm doing it so I can actually have an able body when my kids are older. Like I wanna be able to enjoy my children when I'm older and I won't be able to do that if I have an 80 year old body that can't move, right? So that's something I value. So aligning and doing the things and putting action towards the things you value will actually get you to become that person that you wanna become, you know? So write those values down, write down what are like non-negotiables for you? You know, what are things that you will not compromise? And then there's things that you will compromise. Like, you know, I moved across 6,000 6, miles away from my family to go to BCU Brand Center. That's a huge sacrifice, right? To like move to a new country, not have a single friend, not have a single person around me to kind of learn what I wanted to learn and to grow how I wanted to grow. So there's things that are worth sacrificing for. And I think there's nothing good really comes without sacrifice. You do different sacrifices at different times in your life. Um, but I think, you know, getting a sense of what, you know, I came here, yes, I sacrificed all that. And I moved so far away from friends and family, but I always made it a point 
to speak to friends and family, to see them, you know, as often as I could, to connect with them. So to, you know, stay tethered and keep those bonds alive. Um, so you write down what those things that you care about are, and then do things that kind of get you to, to kind of get there, right? To, to, to lead you to that, who's, you know, who's, you know, Shannon, for example, what do you, how do you see yourself five, 10, 20 years from now? What's the life you want? You know, and that's one thing people don't really talk about. People talk about what the job they want and, you know, the success they want, but nobody really talks about the kind of life they want. And I think that is so important, you know, like what kind of life do you want? Do you want to be surrounded by friends and eating good food? Or do you want to, you know, have a lot of people that you love around you? Do you want, what do you want? You know, what kind of life do you want? Um, and, and, you know, like I, for example, this is like such a small thing, but, you know, I didn't grow up knowing how to cook. And, you know, I think at VCU Brand Center, we ate junk food from 7-Eleven most of the time. But, you know, it's something that I value. I value good nutritious food. So I've made so much effort into learning how to cook good food and, you know, just putting time and attention towards that. And I start learning how to cook good food. You know, I couldn't go on eating junk food all my life, especially with, with kids and I didn't want to feed them junk. So, you know, that's something I valued. So I wanted to put a time and attention doing that. So whenever I can, you know, whether it's on the weekends or, you know, at night or whatever, I cook and I get better and better. I make the same thing over and over again. I get better at better at it every time. So, what are those things that you value? What are the things that you want to you want to have in your life, um, and and put time and energy towards those? And and your job is is important, but it's not your entire life. You know, that it's always just good to remember that because I think in the U.S. especially, you know, I'm not from the U.S., so I have such a Lebanese culture has a lot of like people celebrate a lot and there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of gathering around food and all that stuff. So for me, I've always had that perspective. But, you know, as much as like we just emphasize so much careers and jobs and all that here. But don't forget, don't forget the good stuff, too. You know, don't forget the the, the food and the friends and the family and the people that like fill your heart up, you know, and inspire you and and good music and good concert. I know we're not going to any concerts now, but even if you just play, some, you know, put a Spotify list and play that and do a little dance party or whatever, the things that like inspire you, fill your life with those. And then the thing that will happen also when you fill your life with these amazing things is the things that aren't serving you fall away. You know, the things that aren't really good for you kind of end up just naturally falling away because you're filling your life with all the good stuff that you want. And then the other things just kind of, they just disappear somehow. Can I, <laughs> can I, can I ask a follow-up question to your, uh, the whole spiel you just have now, which I love. That's something that I'm trying to do personally on all my personal time is like try to, to work towards a life that I want and take little actions. But sometimes it's hard, like you were talking about like doing yoga after a long day, mm -hmm. you're so done. So what's like other outside of forcing yourself to do it, is there like something you've found that works for you um, to where it kind of helps you, you know, put one foot in front of the other towards that goal? Um, I would not, like, I would just do as much as you can. So if you have five minutes, do five minutes, do five minutes of breathing exercises, a five minute meditation. I mean, 10, 10 minutes of just doing cat cow on a mat or on a carpet or whatever, like just do that. And, you know, we spend time scrolling on our phones for like half an hour, like <laughs> we can make 10 minutes, we can make, you know, carve out 10 minutes to like do something good for our bodies or, you know, cook a meal or whatever it is. So just don't think that you have to commit to like, oh, I have to do an hour or an hour and a half of this thing. Do little bits, like I have a big meditation practice I don't have time, especially now with kids and work and all this stuff. I used to, before I had kids, I used to sit for an hour. I don't have an hour to sit and meditate anymore. But if I have five minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, yeah, I'm doing it, you know? Whatever you can, just fit it in. At least you're just the practice of doing it regularly. Like that is what I would, you know, 
just do it. The regular practice, um, that is what's going to make the biggest difference in your life. Just constantly doing that thing. And then it becomes a habit. And then you don't know how to exist without it because you're just so used to doing it and you crave it and you need it, you know? Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. I know we went a little over, a lot over, um, <laughs> but thank you so much, Mira. You're booked until 730. So uh, awesome. thanks for talking to us. Everybody set your intentions today. It's October <laughs> 1st. Follow Mira's advice. <laughs> Find your best self. I know fall is such a great time to let go of all the shit you don't want. Like just the same way, look at the trees, the same way the trees are releasing, releasing their leaves, like release that stuff. The stuff that's not serving you, get rid of it. Mm -hmm.